Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Mike Lawler. I'll, I am uh, presenting today a preview of a presentation that will be delivered at the upcoming International Conference on Software Quality and Test Management in San Diego, California. I'll go over um, the details of the conference uh, at the end of this presentation and give you uh, some more information about it. Uh, this presentation is one of several that are being given at the conference. Uh, this particular topic is um, something, uh, this will be an uh, overview of automated testing and how automated testing can be um, infused into an organization. And by that I mean the uh, there's uh, many challenges over the years in getting automated testing to be of value in an organization. So we're going to talk through some techniques uh, related to successfully getting automated testing um, going in an organization that is currently only a future date. And um, this presentation will be also be given live. I'll go over the program on, on Wednesday of the conference. So thank you for attending today. Uh, we do have the opportunity to uh, submit questions throughout. I'll, I'll get to those at the end. Uh, so um, we'll look at that, and uh, if you have a particular question that you want to send directly, you can submit questions uh, throughout, and then if there's a particular comment that you want to make just to me or to the group, you can use the chat feature, I believe. So we'll go ahead and get going. We want to talk today about uh, available technology to support testing in general. Uh, and then various testing categories that may be in use and those that are suitable for automation. Uh, key roles in the, uh, in the effort to get automation going in an organization. And then a methodology that's uh, utilized to uh, get this going. Um, and lastly, we'll talk through a case study of an organization that has actually uh, taken this, I'll call it a pilot to enterprise approach in um, getting the organization utilizing test automation tools. I do also want to let you know uh, one last bit of business is that we will be uh, going until um, uh, for one hour, another 58 minutes, if that long, depends on the questions at the end of the session. And um, so that's how long we plan to uh, deliver this presentation today. So just to define where technology can be utilized to support automation. In, in the use of automated testing tools, and there are several different tools that are out on the market today, we would use um, automation or technology to enhance the manual testing effort. Um, several years ago when I first got started with um, testing, it was, you know, we had uh, spreadsheets that we used and we uh, maybe communicated by email. We didn't really have a defect tracking system. Um, we produced our own reports and kept uh, killed a lot of trees by having a lot of paper evidence of the testing that was done. And then we would um, send out uh, reports through email um, giving a status update, a very manual and laborious process. For functional testing, it was all manual, and um, so we would conduct the tests and, and go through that, and when it was time to uh, repeat the test, we'd get the, the team together again and start again on, on, the, uh, on the manual testing effort. Performance testing, there seem to be some tools out there, but I, I do have some stories about a performance testing effort that was done in a very manual effort. And, um, and then test management, um, you know, it, it was, you know, we, we stored information up on network drives and uh, hoped to remember where we put it and which project it was for. So um, I, a long time ago I got involved in implementing automation or in implementing technology um, in, other, in another industry um, and I found it very useful. Uh, but the key thing was we had to find uh, a lot of the folks that we were going to ask to use that technology to make sure that they were comfortable using it. So one of the big lessons learned that I took out of that effort years ago 
was to allow the folks who we intended to use the technology to um, make sure that they were comfortable and they had a reason to use it. They saw some benefits in it. Um, the second bullet point here is we would, we're using technology to provide repeatable and consistent testing. Uh, I know that I did this, and, and those of you on this call can, or uh, this uh, webinar can uh, kind of confirm yourselves, but uh, there are times that I had to repeat testing uh, maybe for the 10th or 15th time, the same test cases over and over again. And along the way, I might have skipped a step or two. And uh, if I did, I usually, uh, that was usually a problem that uh, showed up in production because I, I skipped a step. So technology allows us as humans to focus in other areas and uh, let the technology do the heavy lifting on repeatable and consistent testing because we're, we're um, uh, confirming or, or uh, developing automated tests that, that are going to run as specifically as we built them and uh, they're not going to skip any steps. Um, they may have some issues in, in uh, executing due to some environmental situations, but it won't be a problem as far as getting repeatable, um, consistent testing if, if everything on the technology side is working well. Typically, we want to make sure that uh, we know what we're testing. So we don't have to complete all of our manual test cases, but we have to make sure we know that, uh, for instance, if we're taking a transaction, we want to uh, put automated testing in with a business transaction. We want to actually execute that business transaction once in the test environment, make sure that it works, and then be able to go from there and record it and um, make sure that we can, uh, that, that, the, that the test can execute appropriately. Now, that test may move out into hundreds of tests. I know, I know one situation where somebody took a business process that uh, was one test and it was a data-driven business process where they were processing a bunch of different business transactions. And so they could build a data sheet um, in Excel or some table and then they could run that test over and over again with different data conditions. I think they, uh, if I remember correctly, they were able to apply automation and automate 5,000 manual test cases with all the different variable, uh, the data variables that had to go through the system. So we just want to make sure before we start down the automation path that the what we're planning to automate actually can be accomplished uh, in the test environment. Application stability. Um, we, we must, you know, version 1.0 of an application is typically not suitable for automation. There's a couple of key things that have to happen here or using technology if we're going to do functional or performance testing. Um, so um, what we'll do is make sure uh, in, in the early stages uh, the development team is learning maybe what objects to uh, use in the application and they might make some changes in the coding standards and what's uh, not visible to the human eye but behind the scenes, the, the name of a field the name of an object, the type of an object. Automated testing requires or actually works with the behind-the-scenes objects that are not visible to the eye, human eye. And therefore, um, we need to have those coding standards and, and those objects stable to make sure that um, you know, we're not doing a, a bunch of changes, a lot of, um, a lot of changes to the automated tests once they're built. So if your organization is constantly changing the object, stand, the object properties and, and making a lot of changes um, in the environment or in the application, you want to wait until that has settled down. Um, if the organization is constantly doing that and that's the normal method of operation, uh, it's not even worth uh, attempting automation because there will be uh, as much maintenance as going on in the application, there's going to be more that needs to be done with any automated suite. So for functional testing, we typically use automation in system integration testing. And in integration, these are reversed actually in real life. Integration testing is for testing a particular module or particular function, making sure that works, and then incrementally adding on more and more functionality in the test. So we want to maybe test the accounts payable process first, and then 
the general ledger process second, and then we want to test them together. And so when we've got the full end-to-end -end business process built in an application, then we'll do a full system test. Uh, and then absolutely, um, you know, the regression testing effort should not be done without the use of automated tools. Uh, take a look, you know, the easy mathematical calculation is how much time do you need to do regression testing typically, and, you know, and that's, that's by definition is um, all of the tests that you uh, have in your inventory need to be executed to make sure nothing else got broken. So that effort typically takes, you know, a few weeks to run a full regression test for a medium-sized application, it may take a, a much longer time. Uh, so take a look at the labor effort involved. You might need several team members to do that. And uh, the mathematics of, of building an automated regression test and, and the, and the uh, cost-benefit analysis works out pretty easily to, uh, to automate the regression test. Um, absolutely, you know, there's no magic bullet here. You, you have to record the test. You have to make sure and, and add in some technical components and some, some features in there to allow it to run unattended. So the first time through that you're building your automated suite, it's going to take a bit of effort. Think about the fact that you're, you're building a, an, an automation application to test your application that's being built. So you should estimate at least the same amount of time as development to build automated testing. Um, I'll talk about performance testing and, and the speed back and forth uh, with there in a minute uh, you know, later on in the presentation, but it's, it's going to take longer to build a full um, functional test than it will a performance test. So uh, you do have to allot that time. Performance testing is definitely an independent and distinct effort from functional test automation. There are some tools today where Somebody says, uh, well, we can, you can build functional tests and they can be used for uh, functional automated tests, and that is possible uh, for the performance test. You can take functional tests. Uh, some tools allow you to do that. Others are very specific and don't let you share or reuse functional tests in, in the performance test software. But the only, re the only real way to get performance testing done is, is with the use of test automation. I'll pause here quickly and tell you the story about um, the one situation where um, there's a, a large municipal police department that was testing out their call system that uh, they would use to communicate with their officers out on their uh, on, on patrol, and they wanted to make sure that uh, the technology could support the volume. So what they did is they got uh, several hundred police officers in one room and uh, gave them each a computer and had them um, all at once start entering calls. Some of this is, you know, they have to enter information into the call. So they were doing this all at once. There was a bullhorn in the front of the room, a uh, person with a bullhorn, and they were telling them what to do and go ahead and get it going. So that was a, a human effort at doing a, a performance test. It wasn't reliable in the fact that it didn't uh, accommodate for any network latency out in the various places where the officers were actually on patrol and it didn't really simulate real-world experience. So, um, but it can be done manually, so that's a kind of a humorous attempt at trying to do performance testing without technology. Um, if you're going to put in technology in to support manual testing, there are specialized skills, no matter what you put in, and you're going to need training. Uh, you're going to take a look at your current processes, figure out how they're going to change with technology, and then um, have, have training in those new processes for your teams, and then you're going to need training in the selected vendor software. Uh, there's, there's specific, um, I think if you can learn one, you can do well in others, but there are some cases where at, at a minimum you need some formal training with the particular vendor software that you selected. The last piece, I ta I've talked about functional and performance testing. There are test management tools, and I, I did allude to that, so defect tracking and requirements management. Um, putting our tests into a centralized repository online to be able to log the results. We want to make sure that we've got test management tools as part of this inventory of technology. The test management tools are probably the easiest to get going because people are now, organizations are now used to uh, online uh, defect reporting, um, online requirements management, sometimes maybe not, um, and certainly um, your test analyst should be 
uh, familiar with how to um, put the uh, test into a centralized uh, uh, tool and then make sure that you can um, uh, go ahead and report status against that in an online tool. So that's a quick uh, definition. I'm just going to step through a few more slides. We'll talk about test management tools first. Um, here's some of the available technology. I talked about a requirements repository, a test repository, defect repository, and then status reporting. If you have um, a few different technologies, you may have just one particular uh, software that a uh, software tool that is used for all of these areas, but you also may have a mixed uh, bag of tools that are out there. Um, if you're in an agile environment, you might use Jira. If you're in, um, 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 you might use the HP tool set. You might have a mix of HP and the rational tool set. Um, there, you have to take a look at what your inventory is. Ideally, you want to have just one that does it all, but um, what you what you can do is set up uh, API communications between these tools and, and collect into um, a central spot so that you can do uh, status reporting in a, in a, um, you know, with some graphics and, and some uh, online real-time counts of what's really going on during test execution. You can also show uh, coverage of uh, requirements by test cases. You can also show current status of a requirement whether or not it's been tested, whether or not it has any defects, and whether or not those defects have been resolved. Uh, you're also going to have project management technology in place, uh, configuration management, version control, uh, portfolio management, and then resource management. Uh, that's typically under the purview of a project management office or a program management office, um, but from a testing standpoint, um, you, you, you should have some technology there. At a minimum, you want to uh, get version control for your tests. Uh, that might that would be included in your test management tool set. But um, if you're not using any test management tool set, then you want to put your test cases, if they're in Excel or some other type of document, you want to put those under a version control uh, technology if you can. Other tools that are available out there for test execution. Uh, you may have some uh, coverage tools to be able to show how much of the code is being exercised during a test. Um, and then um, you want to, that's a pretty handy thing to have because I, I do know of a situation where somebody found a, a critical defect in a piece of code uh, during a regression test that had not been exercised by the users in that particular area in a number of years, but if it had if the users had gone into that functionality, uh, they would have uh, crashed the system. So um, coverage tools are, are pretty helpful. Uh, you can also get uh, keystroke capture and playback tools on a, on a less costly basis to um, allow you to um, you know, attach to your data sheet and go ahead and you know, record your test and play it back. The, 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 some of the functional test the, the functional test automation tools will do this as well, but um, you'll you'll want to uh, you may have some less expensive tools if you haven't gone in for the more expensive functional testing tools. File comparison tools are great, especially in a data warehouse situation, and maybe in in uh, ETL uh, situations where you want to compare files uh, before and after. Uh, those are extremely useful. Test data generators. Um, I can't think of an organization that I've encountered in the last 20 years that feels that they have their test data management under um, good control. So um, there are some test data generator tools out there where you can take some, um, say maybe some production data, you can create your own off of requirements. Uh, you might take some production data and, and mask it. Um, so these are pretty handy. It's pretty cumbersome to get into testing situations without some test data generators. Um, and lastly, it's just text execution and debugging tools. Uh, these are a bit more technical where you're going in to a situation and um, you want to, uh, it's a bit more of a technical test and you want to figure out where the, where the problem is and which line of code is causing the problem, which component in the infrastructure is causing the problem. So these are some tools that are out there available for you. 
for functional testing, um, what you have available, uh, there's a number of different approaches or design options. The, uh, the one that I got involved with several years ago was capture, you know, record and playback or capture and replay. Um, that's the, the basis. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Framework-based, data-driven, keyword-driven, um, event-driven, so you've got, to, you're, you've got to multiple technologies in your test environment, and perhaps you're, you're um, in, a, in a window style application and you're executing a job on the mainframe, you want to get a screen back that says, uh, I've, I've completed the job on the mainframe and now I can continue with my test. Um, out of all of these that are listed here, the most popular is hybrid, meaning that several different design options are typically woven into one particular automated test or suite of automated tests because you've got different design options for different types of tests that you're doing. Here's an example of a data-driven test. We're going to take um, something that we do, do on a regular basis, and, and that's logging into an application. We have to do it on just about every, well, I think on every test that we do. So we want to build a function called login. And then we want to get parameterized values of the username and the password. And then we want to build a table, data table that has uh, both good and bad data in it. And go ahead and build by using the function of login um, and then the parameterized values and then the data spreadsheet you can go ahead and run a data-driven test. This is uh, similar to that example I gave a while back where one test script was uh, recorded that uh, handled 5,000 uh, tests that were done manually. Keyword-driven is combining uh, data-driven and a framework test where you're building a couple of different data tables. Uh, you're building keywords such as login user, uh, shipping today, select cash. These are keywords that have steps within them. So it's, it's one keyword that you can call, and it'll have several steps embedded in that, uh, pulling data from uh, different data tables. And then you'll be able to um, execute a, a much more complex test using a keyword-driven option. Typically, it's a, it's a happy path type test, but you can build in some negative testing in there as well. Um, event driven, this is also uh, useful. I talked about it when you're sending out jobs for uh, or sending a request to a mainframe. This other uh, use of event driven is pretty handy uh, where we have unexpected uh, situations happen during an automated test. Um, I remember years back where you know I walked in, we kicked off a, a test on a, on a, you know, at the end of the day, an automated test. We came in the next morning, and it was on step two of that test with um, an error message like the document failed to print. And what we had figured out was somebody came in during the night and unplugged the printer to do the cleaning and uh, caused this uh, the printer to become unavailable. So we're stuck on step two or step five or whatever it was and the test could not continue. So by using uh, an event-driven design option, you can get uh, recovery scenarios in there, so it captures what actually happened and, and, and continues on with the rest of the steps. Pretty useful to ensure um, unattended functional testing. And just uh, a quick overview here of some design options uh, or, or some things that you should have in place for uh, automated testing. Uh, with functional testing. This is uh, HP's Quick Test Professional as an example, but there are many others. You're going to have standard and custom GUI objects. You're going to have a function library. I talked about building functions such as login and things like that. You're going to have a, an initiation script that decides which, um, which uh, configuration you're going to be testing in. So it could be you know, Windows, uh, Windows operating system and a certain browser. Uh, and then you can uh, also set up a, a, another test flow for uh, a different configuration of, of uh, the test that you want to execute. Um, actions are a number of different steps within a transaction that you can record. Recovery scenarios I talked about. 
and then local and global data tables. These are all of the technical components that you're going to have as part of a functional automated test. You'll have these as performance tests as well, but um, it's a different style. So let's talk about performance testing. Functional testing, just to, by comparison, we're, functional testing we're comparing, we're making sure that each screen or each field on the screen works the way it's designed. Uh, performance testing, we're making sure that the end-to-end -end transactions are, are performing in the infrastructure and they can complete properly and looking for bottlenecks. So uh, the important difference here is that um, we, we want to make sure that um, all of the different uh, the routers, uh, the application servers, uh, database servers, and all of that um, are operating as expected. So um, that's important. It's a different style test altogether. We don't care, honestly, about whether or not um, there's a, a alpha or a numeric character in a field on a performance test. We're just going to go through the transaction and make sure it gets done. So there could be uh, several things in the infrastructure that um, are failing or, or that are causing problems in performance testing. The beauty of this is that you build a, a, a standard test of a, of a transaction and you're repeating it over and over again, uh, uncovering different problems that present themselves. So you know you may run the test the first time and the router might be a, a problem. You clean that up and fix that and then you run the test again and then you're going to discover that the router is having a problem with the web server and on and on. So, you know, performance testing is pretty interesting. Uh, the comparison here also in building it, functional testing may take you know, 8 to 10 weeks to get about 30 percent of your uh, application automated and uh, maybe nine months or more to get it fully automated or as much as you want to. Um, where performance testing, you can build a fully capable and very effective uh, performance test that can be reused over and over again in four to six weeks. Um, the other thing that's happening in, in performance testing is you're, you're testing the various communication protocols. So um, it, uh, it, it works out, uh, it's a fairly complex test, you're testing the, the infrastructure and you're also making sure that you're getting the various communication protocols going on. Uh, what happens here is you're uh, not getting in too deep in what you have to buy, but you're going to have to have different uh, types of users, technical users, they call them virtual users, to communicate on the different communication protocols. So uh, functional testing, just a quick comment, functional testing you might spend eight to twelve thousand dollars for uh, a floating license. Uh, performance testing for a thousand virtual users um, might cost you, you know, a hundred thousand to, to uh, hundred and fifteen, hundred and twenty thousand. Just a quick comparison. Performance testing, you know, I gave you the design types in, in uh, functional testing. Um, these are the design types of the performance testing types. Load testing is uh, making sure that you're getting as many uh, users on the application as you can at any particular time. So you you're just keep continuing to confirm uh, that, you know, we expect uh, 5,000 users, so we can handle 5,000 users in a typical experience. A baseline test is a small test of one test or one user or five users um, to make sure that the application is stable. Scalability and capacity is increasing the workload until the infrastructure breaks. So that's just running, adding on users constantly, or you know, in a, in a, in a I'll call it a rising fashion. Um, incrementally adding on users to see where the application breaks. And it's pretty interesting because uh, it'll break at different points uh, and, and the more users you get. Stress and hotspot testing is making sure that a particular area of functionality um, is uh, able to handle the load. So my example here is a retail situation where um, you, uh, you're a retailer, you've done a deal with uh, MasterCard, you want to make sure that you can handle the volume of MasterCard transactions uh, over a specific period because you're going to get a percentage of the MasterCard receipts. Um, and so you want to make sure all the MasterCard transactions process, you know, a high volume can process. Spike and bounce testing is kind of an interesting one. And, and this is, uh, I call this the, uh, the Super Bowl, NFL Super Bowl. You know, the, when you go on commercial, uh, 
all of a sudden users are shown a bunch of really cool things to see on commercial break. They jump on their computers and try to get the deal that's offered. So all of a sudden there's a massive increase in, in traffic. Um, and, and reversely, when the game come back, comes back on, they're back in paying attention. The, that's a uh, massive reduction in, in traffic. So you want, it, interesting things happen there as well. Um, so that's a, a style of testing that's useful. Endurance testing, I call that the uh, Black Friday retail effort. That's where um, you know, you've got one-day sales that are going on that, that millions of people are coming to. You want to make sure your infrastructure can handle that. And then integrity testing is combined with functional testing and a stress test to make sure that your um, infrastructure is just stable. You do that every now and then. Here's some example of performance testing objectives. What's the application response time? Uh, can the, is it reliable under a heavy workload? Which configuration of my servers, my routers, my um, other technical components uh, is the right uh, configuration to handle the volume? Uh, capacity planning, how, at what point do it, does, does it break? Um, acceptance testing, is it stable enough to go uh, live? Bottleneck identification, which particular piece of the infrastructure is causing a problem? You could have a, uh, a cluster um, or a server within a cluster that's causing a problem. Regression testing, just take it out for a ride and see what happens, and then a product evaluation. There's some other uh, uh, things that happen during a performance test. You're monitoring the firewall. You're looking at uh, the load balancing to make sure it's handling correctly. Uh, you're looking for a, a faulty web server within a cluster. Database server that all of a sudden is uh, choked up, can't uh, feed the data, or an application server that has decided to take a break and not respond to anybody. So these are some monitoring that, uh, that actually goes on within a performance test. Uh, to, with most of the performance testing tools. Um, some of it's done, uh, uh, also done by the operations team or the network support folks. They have their own tools. Here's an example of a concurrent test. You know, people sometimes get confused. Um, I want to be able to have uh, you know, 1,500 users um, on the system. Well, or 5,000 users in this case. So how many transactions do I have to be able to support in one minute if um, I'm going to be able to support 5,000 users for two hours. So let's do the math here. And the transaction length is five minutes, so to take uh, two hours, 120 minutes divided by five minutes. So 24 iterations need to be run through for each user. There's 5,000 users, so you have 120,000 transactions. So you're going to be running 1,000 transactions per minute. Uh, one, you want to make sure that the infrastructure is designed to support that. And two, uh, when the code is developed, you want to make sure that it can handle uh, the throughput that's necessary. So pretty interesting. And this is a good way to make people aware of what, uh, when the business says, I need it to be able to support 5,000 users at a time, there's some other, um, some other information that you want to show them what 5,000 users means. Uh, services, uh, web services are, are very actively being used today. When, when uh, uh, I first, when it first came on board, it was kind of a, a, a handy thing. But I'll, I'll give you an example of a web service. You, you want to log in. Uh, you want to go build, uh, book a reservation for uh, your trip. You want to book an airline reservation, a hotel reservation, and um, your rental car all at the same time in the same spot. You can do that on, on one site. Uh, what's happening behind the scenes is that web services are there. They're taking the information that you're putting in and then reaching out through the web service infrastructure to uh, confirm that uh, your requests are being handled. So it's done at the middleware level, and um, um, it's, it's uh, where the main frame was elephant size, volume of transactions, or, or how long it took to process a transaction. Web services are net size or small flies and they're constantly buzzing around a lot of interaction going on. So um, what we have to make sure with automated, uh, with technology, we want to make sure we've got traceability of relationships between business processes and services, the services and the code that's built to deliver those services, and then the services and the test scripts and the code. 
Um, so we're going to do both functional and performance testing with, auto, uh, with web services testing tools uh, to compare integration to other services, integration to applications, and then the performance capabilities of the services. Uh, we need to, uh, for web services, we need to validate within the application to make sure it's stable. So you might have some web services going on. Single sign-on is, is another example of a service where you, you log in once and you, you're given access to a bunch of different applications. So you want to make sure that that works. Um, you also want to make sure that the services work between applications, between business processes or business partners. And then you may have some services that are on the, on the technology side that um, people need to be able to see and, and uh, that, that aren't seen by the user but are, are handled in, within the technology infrastructure. Here are some examples of where you're going to apply technology. Um, human interface testing, you may have a certain look and feel to your website. You've got to make sure that that look and feel is standard. So you can use uh, functional testing tools to confirm that. You can use uh, unit testing tools or functional testing tools with unit tests to do uh, unit testing. You can do your configuration testing with uh, functional tools, performance testing with the performance tools recovery testing with functional tools, security testing, coexistence testing is making sure that a number of different applications can coexist on a desktop. So that's pretty handy with functional tools. Um, business driven testing, we talked about functional interface testing, end-to-end, uh, -end data integrity. Um, basically everything except for beta testing and user acceptance testing um, would have an applicable use of automated uh, technology to support that. With user acceptance testing, you could use technology to populate the environment. And uh, that, that could be useful. But otherwise, uh, everything else um, is there's some type of technology that could be used to streamline the testing effort and make it more efficient. Some of the roles on an automation project. Uh, in the analysis and strategy phase, you're going to have a test automation analyst and a strategist who have had experience in implementing automated testing in, a, in another organization. And um, it's uh, and they're also going to do the proof of concept to see whether or not it's worth um, doing. So um, they will also uh, present, put together the presentation to your management team, and um, and uh, it should be uh, someone who can is capable of putting together that report, doing the analysis for you. Uh, you typically want to hire someone from the outside to do this, and then train your folks on on the rest of the life cycle. Your test automation architect is a critical person who uh, has had strong experience in implementing automated implementing technology into your testing team and uh, building it, training people, showing them how to do it, um, and making sure that it works on an ongoing basis. During the construction phase, your automation developer could be a man will be an automation developer. Your automation developer will be manual testers and automation analysts working together to build out the inventory of automated tests. In execution of results management, um, Automated tests are executed by manual testers, and the results are reviewed by them. Uh, questions that may come up and support will go to an automation analyst. And lastly, a project closure. Your test lead and project manager will lead the effort, but everybody will be involved to ensure that uh, they understand what worked and what didn't work and what should be done for the future. Just a quick uh, run through of where automation fits in. Project life cycle, is, this is not PMI. Uh, equivalent across the top, but you initiate a project, you do planning, you, you execute against the project and you close it. Then the software development life cycle, planning, requirements, design, development, and acceptance, and then into production. The testing life cycle where you determine scope after the requirements or while the requirements are being defined, build your test strategy, your test plans, construct your tests, execute them, and evaluate the tests. For automation, you're going to define your automation test strategy during the planning and requirements phase so that you can get the budget, if necessary, to uh, get the licenses or get the technology in place. You're going to build an automation test plan, which is your approach to implementing automation once the test strategy is built 
for the application. And a test automation test plan is built for each application. You're going to build your automated tests while manual tests are being done. Um, and, uh, and then you're going to execute them uh, in alignment with the manual tests and evaluate the results. So that's a combination of where automated testing fits into all of the other life cycles. The methodology, which I laid out a little while ago, you do analysis and strategy to determine the feasibility of automation. You put together a design uh, that uh, includes how manual testers are going to build the tests and maintain them. Then you go into construction, you execute them, evaluate the uh, situation and see, evaluate the suite and see if it worked for you and make adjustments and then um, figure out how it's going to be used after that. Uh, for automation tools, you're going to need to understand the operating systems, application languages, protocols, browsers, and the platform it's built on because different tools are going to work better under different um, uh, technology platforms. Uh, so we'll, we'll go, other courses we have go into more detail on the considerations here. So the goals and challenges of putting in automated tools or technology. Uh, for functional, you're going to need to make sure that your manual test cases are uh, have enough information in there uh, with actions and expected results so that they can be um, automated. Uh, make sure that your manual test Analysts are actively involved in building the inventory of automated tests and executing them. Uh, this is for functional testing. You're going to need to implement a standardized, repeatable approach instead of jumping into it new with each build or in each release. You want to be able to have a, a standardized, repeatable approach that can be customized for each technology platform. And lastly, um, you want to make sure your test team is been staffed and trained to the appropriate level in the technology you're going to use and the supporting processes to build automation. Some of the challenges, you're going to have customized scripting, so you do need someone on the automation support team. If you had a, uh, just to give you a quick example, if you had a team of 10, you would have two people who are automation analysts and the other eight who are manual, um, and, and the automation analysts would be you know, deeply technical and able to, to build out the customized scripting. Uh, it is very expensive. It can be a total waste of time. I've, I've seen people build out a, an inventory of thousands of tests and then uh, changes were made and they weren't maintained properly and that whole suite had to be thrown out. Um, and it was a big waste of money. There are limitations of the tools with each technology platform. Nothing does everything in spite of what the salespeople will tell you. Uh, you do need uh, developer expertise in building out the automation suite and, and using the technology and then the application is constantly changing. So the combination of these three things make this for you know, ongoing challenges. It's not something that can, shouldn't be done, but you want to recognize that there's limitations and expertise in the tools and the application is constantly changing. And then uh, lastly, you know, you have to, uh, you know, you can build automated tests for the wrong reasons. Um, you can, I know of a situation where somebody took two months to build something, uh, an automated test for something that was executed for four hours each time twice a, twice a year. So that was a big waste of money. And lastly, you want to have uh, the culture ready to support and use automation. You, you can bring in an automation analyst and have them build all these great automated tests and then your manual test team is fearful of using it or resistant. So you want to get buy-in from your team first and then you know, make sure that your management team and your executives understand the commitment that is necessary to make this successful. Challenges, you want to make sure that you're getting sufficient payback. You want to make sure that your results of the automated tests are accurate because you can run an automated test that, that looks like it passed everything and in fact it did not do anything. And I'll talk more about, about that in the course. Um, and then you want to make sure that what you, the, the permission that you were given to do, you know, the reason you were given to go out and get automation done by executive management, you, you want to make sure that uh, you are meeting those requirements first and then getting other benefits on top of that. And then you, there's a number of different roles that need to be involved outside of the ones that I talked about. You, you may need a DBA, you know, some network folks and various folks from outside of the test team. You want to make sure that they're available. 
and then there's unrealistic expectations you're going to be able to do 100% of your tests automated. That is an absolute unrealistic expectation. At best, for functional testing, you might get um, 80%. Uh, for performance, you're, you're going to do only the most um, demanding of the transactions, so you're not going to automate everything with performance testing. In, in the uh, five features or the five phases of the methodology, in the analysis phase, you're going to understand the need. In the design phase, you're going to understand the best solution from both a business and technical viewpoint that will work for your organization and your technology. In the construction phase, you're going to build the solution. In the execution of re results phase, you're going to look at the automated test suite ATS and see what can be made better or, or uh, make it work on a, in an unintended manner. And then you're going to identify any application defects that need to be put in. In the project closure, you're going to take lessons learned and future goals, figure out how to continue using and getting the benefit of this. The important thing that is uh, here is that um, tip, people typically jump right into execution and results management and, and skip the analysis and design phase. And the analysis and design ones phase are the most important. Um, in, in analyzing, there's goals and expectations, determining the requirements to implement the automated testing, understanding the infrastructure, evaluating available technology, building the automation strategy, making sure the test environments are, are ex built to support automation, which is a very high volume, then do the implementation and then make sure all the stakeholders are involved so they un understand the benefits. Um, analyzing the automation needs and continuing, we're going to take a look uh, at the requirements, both personnel and technical, choose a pilot application, identify the resources who can work on this proof of concept, develop a work plan for the implementation, and then review the approach with all the stakeholders. The, uh, we want to get uh, achievable automation requirements, and, and the key here is that um, um, we want to make sure that we're going to have success with our initial effort. And, and you, you could have success. You know, you could do your proof of concept and, and all of that and then come up and, and determine that um, automation is really not suitable. So you want to just make sure that you've got something that defined that people know the definition, definition of success when the automation proof of concept is done. And then you're going to have permission to continue the effort and be able to continue to prove the value of using technology with the automated testing. Um, so here's the case study. There was total manual testing, uh, a total manual testing effort for several application teams. The budget was flat from year to year and was expected to remain flat for several years. There were Automated tools that were available in the organization, but they were not being utilized. The manual test teams had some technical knowledge, and they were interested in automation, or so we thought. So that's the situation that uh, we went into. Um, and everybody was tired of running regression tests and uh, not having enough time to do things right. Um, so what happened is, um, the organization brought in consultants who were experienced in designing and implementing automation suites. So these were folks who had been successful someplace else. And, and when you're reviewing the opportunity or reviewing the, the, um, the firms that you may want to bring in from the outside, or even your own folks, you want them, you may have somebody in-house who can do this, but you want them to have proven experience and, and, and you want to talk to the folks that they worked with to uh, have them give you um, testimony that they worked well. Um, those consultants uh, were brought in to be the support team and to do the design, do the implementation, train the manual testers on how to maintain the suite, work with them to build it. And so they uh, first conducted analysis sessions with various teams to come up with feasible automation requirements. And for each application that they uh, worked with, they, they first created an overall automation strategy. So here are the standards that we're going to use in, you know, regardless of the techno technology platform. And then uh, for each application or each, um, 
each yeah for each application they built a specific plan outlining what was going to be automated what was not going to be automated and and the approach and and so that when the automation effort was done or while it was being worked on they could track progress against that they worked with uh, various teams, the test teams, to um, build out and uh, complete the, the building of the technical components first, and then to complete the uh, build out of the inventory of automated tests. The manual test analysts were trained in how to record, use the technology to record sample scripts for each of the group of tests. And then the automation analysts enhanced the scripts and created reusable technical components such as functions, actions, keyword, and, and those types of things to allow the scripts and recovery scenarios to allow the scripts to run unattended. And then the automation analyst uh, built a user guide to using, uh, they built the, the design document and, and user guide so that the manual test analyst, uh, anybody new coming on board, could uh, use that documentation and uh, gather results, um, or go ahead and execute the tests and um, gather the results. Um, a small group of tests were, were run to confirm that the manual testers understood the process, and then um, the remaining automated tests were built out. Currently, um, and, and then the plan was for maintenance to be done with each release by both manual and automated test analysts. The results uh, on a small scale, on the proof of concept, 96 manual tests existed for regression of smoke tests, which required about 660 hours to execute. 80% were automated. The total effort for a mixed and manual automated regression of smoke tests required 224 hours to execute. So there's a drastic reduction in execution time. Um, so at this point, um, the, the other important thing about the case study was that these are folks who, who did not have the technical skills to um, do this, so they did have to be trained. Um, some of them were resistant to the technology, so those teams took a little bit longer to convince that their jobs were not going away, but uh, overall um, the organization is, is, uh, is those teams who built the automation are successfully using it today. And uh, the key thing there was getting the manual testers to understand the value of uh, using automation to get their job done. They got their weekends back, um, or they could, they could get the regression test done, they could do a more thorough job and minimize the risk of having defects show up in, in production. I'm going to go ahead and open up the question screen and see if I have so uh, one question I have is what does ATS and AUT stand for? ATS is the Automated Test Suite. So that's your inventory of technical components and automated test scripts that um, make up your automation test suite. Um, your manual test suite, MTS, would be your manual test cases and, and uh, your data and all of that. So um, um, the technical components I mentioned would be functions, actions, um, recovery scenarios, and, and um, other things like that to enow, enable the suite to be able to run unattended. AUT is application under test. Um, I think that's the only question that I can see for now. I'm going to open up chat and see if I see anything else in here. I'll look one more time. Okay, so uh, let me go back to an earlier question. Automation is not valid for user acceptance tests. Why, why do you believe automation is not valid for UAT? Um, the, the style of testing done for UAT is typically scenario-based, where they take, you know, go ahead and process a particular transaction, and they leave it up to the user to decide how they're going to do that within the application. So you want that... Um, you want that you, the, the UAT tester to use their own judgment and, and their flow to test out how they might do it. And each one does it differently. So it's a really good test of the application uh, from the user perspective. So 
and, and, and they're also looking at look and feel, and it's a different style of testing altogether. Um, so comparing uh, websites, uh, what's, what are good test tools for comparing websites and uh, the differences, for comparing different websites on differences? Um, I would think any of the functional testing tools that, that are GUI-based or graphical user interface-based, um, and um, those uh, you record the test in one and then uh, replay it in the other, and it'll show you the differences between what was recorded on one website and the other, and that's a good, um, good way, the most efficient way to capture the differences between two websites. So, Quick Test Professional, uh, the Rational Functional Tester, um, most of the, the functional testing tools out there with record and playback with the ability to capture the differences would be, rest, uh, would be useful. Uh, and the presentation will be available. The, the, the last question will be the presentation be available um, and the slides. Uh, this is being recorded. It will be made available uh, for folks. Um, I don't know the exact time and date, but the, uh, we'll get some information out to the folks who came to this. Um, we have no application, no automation yet. How do we know if it's if your application is stable enough? I talked about a little bit of that, um, um, a little bit of that, where you want to make sure the development team is not constantly changing the coding standards. Um, and, and uh, changing object names and object properties. Um, if that's stable, then you, you've got a pretty good chance of success. Uh, minimum number of staff to do manual and automated tests is another question. I think um, the, the uh, minimum number is at least one automation analyst and a few other um, manual testers. There can be some benefit there. So a team as small as two or three would be suitable. Uh, do I know any tools that handle Flex? That's a great question. Flex was a big problem for a number of years. Um, Quick Test Professional claims they've got it fixed now. Um, I would go back to Adobe and and you know maybe get some of their folks and see what they so what they think, but uh, the only one I've heard of so far that handles flex reasonably is is HP's Quick Test Professional. Uh, Visual Studio is that a good tool for automation? I've heard good things about it. I haven't had my hands on it, um, but I think it's a pretty good tool. Uh, multiple browser testing. You want to record your test, most of the functional tools can handle multiple browser testing. What you're going to do is record your tests you know, in the multiple browsers and then kick the, you can kick them off all at once and run them all at once. So that's the beauty of executing automation. Um, somebody asked the ratio. I said one. I've answered that, I think. Uh, if there's no GUI, can you still do automation? Yes. Um, and it's um, it is useful, and I'm I'm going to say technology. So there's we've got folks who are building SQL to to do backend data validation, and they're calling a bunch of scripts and and then uh, calling in a file comparison tool and doing that. So there's a lot of possibilities there. Um, SOA is service oriented architecture or web services. Somebody asked about that. Um, let's see, I'm looking at the time. We've got one minute left. I'm going to hold. I'm going to uh, get these answers and see if we. Um, I think I've answered most of them. The only one is, what do you do about an outside vendor? Uh, you want to. You still want to build automated tests in your environment to validate that the outside vendor has delivered what they're what they promised. So. Um, the last thing I'm going to do is talk about the program. I'm going to switch over and see if I can show that. This is coming up uh, the week of the 29th to the 3rd. And um, there are it's a week-long conference. I'll be presenting on Monday the 29th. 
uh, this this overview in more detail in this particular presentation in a one hour session on Wednesday the uh, Wednesday the first. Um, it's a great location. The uh, location in San Diego is um, it's going to be a great time and a lot of great people. I encourage you to get there in person if you can because the value of this conference is people who can um, get together and share stories and that's that's really the best value. At this time I think we'll go ahead and uh, end the presentation and uh, this will be available. Uh, we'll get some information out. Uh, let me see if I can try to get, hold on one second. Can we see the screen now? Somebody said we can't see the entire screen. Okay, so this is the conference. I do want to show you a picture of the hotel as one last. If you can't have a good time overlooking the harbor in San Diego and around the pool when uh, it's, it works pretty well. So um, that's it for now. Thank you for attending and we'll get information out to you.